I'd like to start by introducing Carl um, with System Resource. And Carl's going to talk about deterministic switching on IP networks. Carl, take it away. OK. This is actually meant to be a dialogue as we get closer to the end. Um, many, many moons ago, about oh, 20 years ago, I was doing a lot of work on large scale uh, SDI networks at that particular time. And I started to look at IP networks and the biggest problem that we had, at least back then in switching over, changing over to an IP platform was the fact that IP networks really had um, no deterministic characteristics at all. Now things have changed, but you know, have they really gotten to a place where we can say that they are deterministic? And if that's you know, and if that's true or not true, do we even care? So I guess the first thing that we need to talk about is what is deterministic switching? Because I don't know that they're, you know, from us old media guys who've been around in the in the video business for a long time, we have a pretty good idea of this. But in the network side, I've learned that not everybody has a um, has the same definition of what a deterministic uh, switch is. So the definition that I normally use is that changing from one packetized flow to a to another at either a prescribed exact time or location in the packet flow is truly a deterministic switch. In other words, we can either define an exact time or an exact place in the flow and make a transition at that point. So that's the definition that we're working from in this uh, presentation. So a little history, because what I'm doing here is I'm going to relate the IP switch to a routing switcher in the, in the old terms from a functional point of view. And so if we look at the history of routing switchers in the old days, we had the old glitch switch where you press the button and there's actually a mechanical uh, function that occurs um, switching from one uh, source to another source. And then electronics uh, cross point switching started to happen and so then we could do we could select and pr or preview a, uh, a function and then press a take button to exact the uh, change at a specific time. And then we had multiple levels of content so we could have multiple streams that were connected and we could break, break those streams away. You know, like if you've got four audios, you can select a video and one audio and leave the other audios out if you didn't want to do that. So we had different levels of content that were all grouped together in a flow. And then the ability to do remote control switching, switching away from the device or switching into some place that's away from the device that you're controlling. And since video is based on, um, you know, multi showing multiple frames in sequence, the ability to switch at the at a particular frame and not in the middle of a frame was very handy. So vertical interval switching, switching in a space where there's really nothing happening in the content. So SEMPTE uh, recommended practice 168 allowed us to do that. And so that led to not only switching in the vertical interval, but picking which vertical interval. So that's frame accurate switching. And then we have automatic input timing that's come along to where you don't necessarily have to have everything you know, exactly aligned where the alignment of video can come in. And then time defined control of video switching where you can actually set up a predetermined time that you want a particular switch to happen and it will happen at that time without the operator having to do anything additional. And so that's kind of the history of where routing switchers have come to where they've become more Instead of just being something to set the system up, they've become more and more integral in the actual process of a production or um, a stream, you know, video happening, of media happening. So if we look at this, the asterisks in those particular functions require deterministic switching. So this is where this is where we have come to in the past, you know, from a routing switcher point of view. <clears throat> so the applications that those get used in are in a master control or a presentation situation, 
where you're actually selecting different things live on the air, um, not necessarily a live production, but the selection of the media being presented to the subscriber or the user or the viewer is being controlled. Um, so that's one function. The other is commercial insertion, where you have a particular time you want to put the commercial in. And from, you know, I don't know if ad agencies are still sticklers as much as the, today, as much as they are in the past, but in the past, they really demanded frame accurate switching so that you could say, yes, they got their full 30 seconds, you know, not uh, 29 seconds and, uh, and 15 frames that they got the whole thing. And so in production switchers, you know, in the front end, being able to select the actual sources that you're going to look at and process in a vision mixer or production switcher, uh, whether that was an assignable control panel or whether it was an aux bus that was feeding a VVE or something like that. These are all things that require deterministic switching in order for these applications to work. And this was true in cuts only editing. You could do that. Um, and editing really is very definitive as far as the frames and the actual location of the stream that, stream that you want to get into. And then there's live real-time switching. So these are the applications in the process and the workflows that historically have required deterministic switching. And so if we look at this, we say, well, you know, how are these functions provided today? And in the IP world, um, Thomas Edwards, I don't remember how many years ago, probably about five or six years ago, um, was doing some work on his own to, uh, actually he was with Fox, so what I mean by on his own was his work with Fox in the lab that he had there, and he was trying to figure out, okay, what are the switch options that we have in IP networks? And he came up with three, and the first is that you're switching in the source, um, so if you have like a unicast or something like that, that switch is occurring in the source. And you have switching in the destination, like multicast or something else where you're joining or leaving a particular flow. And the third one was actually within the network. Is it happening in the network at the network switch? And based on his finding at that particular time, it was recommended that these switch functions to have deterministic switching needed to happen in either the source or the destination but not in the network. So this presentation, what I want to do today is have a dialogue as, you know, is this something that we want to have in the particular switch network or is it something that we still want to have in the edge? So, so my question to all of the people here is, is there a need or a desire for IP network switches to provide the particular applications that I'm talking about or to have deterministic switching. So I'm opening the floor up uh, for people to comment on this as to how you feel about that. Obviously, Carl, these, a number of these functions have been proven by Thomas Edwards right in the, in the network and we've had presentations from him in the past on that. Um, so um, I wondered if you had any observations on what Thomas has, uh, had said and what he had proved earlier about switching in the network. Yeah, actually, in one of the reasons I'm giving this presentation is in the presentations that I've heard from Thomas is um, while we have SDN, that is the first time we've actually been able to get into a switch and do live switching in an IP switch up to, up to where we had SDN, we didn't even have that option because we had no way to get into the uh, the tables in, you know, from a live dynamic point of view to actually make these switches. But SDN has given us uh, software defined networks have given us the ability to actually get in and talk to the switch itself. And so now we have the ability to get in and actually make that switch, but I have yet to see a, um, an application of SDN that's actually deterministic. And you know maybe somebody else is doing something on this that uh, I haven't heard about, but that's part of why I'm asking the question today. Part of this is education for me, um, you know, in that function. But the other is trying to find out, you know, once again, do we even care? Because if we're happy that this is all happening on the edge, or that what we're what we're doing within the network is non-deterministic, then you know that's fine. But I. 
just wanted to raise the question again, because to me, it's not a topic that I'm hearing much about. Um, and I know that AMLA has a, um, has a group that's actually working on switching within the networks. But from what I've been able to see in their work, I really haven't seen that there's a mechanism for either a frame accurate or a deterministic switching process. And maybe I'm missing something. So we have a response from Thomas who's uh, attending. And Thomas, if you would, uh, Carl's going to invite you to unmute. And uh, if you would, go ahead and um, chime in here. And uh, great to see you. Yeah, go ahead, Thomas. Thanks, yes, Justin. so so you know, something that I was really concerned about regarding uh, uh, switching at the destination was this double bandwidth penalty, the fact that you've got to join the next flow before you leave the last flow. But as it turns out, that doesn't seem to be that much of a problem. We seem to have so much bandwidth these days that the double bandwidth uh, penalty at the destination does not appear to be a major problem. And it appears to be working fairly well in installations. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've, I, I came up with source time switching as another potential solution. I know one vendor investigated it, but to the best of my knowledge, that was one uh, vendor investigating it for a short period of time. And now I think everyone has pretty much uh, given up and gone to destination time switching. Okay, great. Thank you, Thomas. Appreciate that. Um, so um, it seems maybe by not getting an answer, Carl, you may have your answer. <laughs> I don't know, but so far we've, we've got Thomas's comment, but I don't see anybody, um, typing in from a, a, uh, kind of an end user point that, uh, that switching in the network and on a uh, real time basis is is a requirement. So maybe that's, maybe that's the answer you, uh, you got. Yeah. And that's, this isn't, uh, unexpected because the fact that this topic hasn't been raised, um, you know, publicly in the meetings that we have in the VSF, or I haven't even heard it raised in SIMPTI. Um, so I'm not hearing people screaming from the user base. And so this presentation, is meant to be a def kind of a more definitive statement as opposed to just, you know, listening for the crickets in the room when nobody's talking about it, it's time to find out, you know, actually raise the question and find out if the crickets still the rule. And that sounds like that's probably the case here. And as you said, I'm getting my answer this way, but it's not <coughs> unexpected. Yeah, we've got a, we've got a couple of people though that are here, Mike Bainey, uh, who, uh, Great to hear you on there, Mike. Um, Hi, Brad. Or hopefully we'll hear you in a moment. And also John Mayotte if, uh, is in the queue. Um, Mike, I hope you're doing well and, and staying healthy and uh, take it away. Yeah, um, we, we do quite a bit of 2110 work in, in our facility in the Woodlands for both Disney and, and various other things. Um, one of my concerns with this is I, there were there were times when this seemed really interesting, but as we've gone deeper and deeper into it, the concern is for me this adds a lot of complexity to support, and you start to drive up the as you drive up the complexity, you drive up the cost of the switches and everything else. And so, if it was easy, I would say yeah, let's have everything. But I, I feel like this one, the cost of implementing it might be more than, in terms of complexity and just cost, might be more than we want to go. And is that because you aren't, uh, that, that as you think about kind of the control aspects of that, it becomes a nightmare? What it, What is it that becomes complex? I can think of the answer, but uh, I think you've well, been looking at it seriously. Well, for, for us right now, we have, I think, approximately the capability of 13,000 individual streams. And just coordinating all those streams and provisioning and, and, and every, everything else, it just, any, when there's an issue, troubleshooting that becomes more difficult, that type of thing. Dealing with it at the end makes it much simpler and easier to isolate. 
I'm not saying you can't do it this way. I'm saying I'd have to see a lot to, to get to a point where, yeah, this is easier. But you're saying at the woodlands, you don't have a use case that's powerful well, we do enough to similar have you to guys what, tackle that. Yeah, we do similar to what Thomas says is we're, we're make before break at the edge yeah. at, at, at this time. And that seems much easier because then if you've got an issue, you've got one place to look. If I've got 40 network switches and I'm trying to do this in the network, now it can be much more complex. And if you have to actually troubleshoot and look at one of those switches, then you you risk affecting a lot of other things. And it just it just adds a lot of complexity for troubleshooting. Because anytime you you interact with a component that has many, many feeds going through it, you risk a lot. Whereas if you're having an issue with an end device, you can much more limit the number of things that are impacted by that. And that, that's more coming from, you know, 724, 365 support of this, of this system. There's no, it's not like a, a production truck where, you know, you've got a couple hours to get this thing working. And then when the event's over, you can go in and tear through it. Our stuff is is on all the time. We're we're barely able to schedule half hour hour maintenance windows to troubleshoot and work on things. Yeah, and you bring up an interesting point there too, which I don't know, Carl. Maybe that's what you were getting to a little. I think in one of your points earlier, but which switch, right? I mean, these facilities don't have one switch in them, one IP switch in them. I think you just said forty, um, Mike and. You know, if you're going to do this this switching in the network, I think there's a whole question there architecturally of where does that switch happen? How do you know you've got the right version of software on the switch to support it? Um, I can just see a, that and, and, starts to become an unwrapping an onion exercise really quickly. Well, and and as you're waiting for it to be, to mature. You're, you're updating, you're updating, and all of a sudden, every time you update 40 switches, you've got an outage, you know? And, and so, so I'm not saying no, I'm saying to do this would be very hard. Okay. Well, okay. I think in a non-SDN environment, uh, I would agree with you that uh, it's, it's difficult to control different things, but if we deploy SDN in a network, you've already gotten to the point where now you're actually going in and controlling that switch. Um, yeah. and, and, and where you, you know, my SDN history has car. been that it's difficult to control, you know, what, you know, in some of the systems that I've been working with at AT&T, we've got like two or 3000 devices on the network that are at the destination end that now my control system has to go out and control all of those devices. And, you know, I have a saying, um, in the work that I've done at SDN is we have a very simple system, but we break everything on scope because of the literal number of all of the devices that we our control system has to control. So back in the old days in the SDI world, that really wasn't a problem because we just told the SDI switch what to do and it did it. And everything downstream or upstream, um, you know, really didn't need to be instructed to do anything. So the actual software complexity of the control system was much simpler. Now that we've gone into the IP network, we no longer have that centralized control process that it's a distributed control. We're either talking to the source or the destination and telling thousands of these things what to do at any given time. So, you know, to me, SDM is a real welcome thing to actually make this more centralized. And I'm only bringing uh, the deterministic thing up now is because we do have the ability to do centralized control but as you said, if everything's working fine the other way, in the, if it ain't broke, you don't need to fix it either. So I'm, I'm not necessarily preaching and trying to get a, uh, you know, an industry to move in a direction. I'm just trying to figure out with what we have now, is it working okay and nobody really cares? And that's really kind of what I'm hearing. So I'm anxious to hear what John Mayot has to say about this. Yeah, John, take it, take it away. I think you had a comment sure. as well. Yeah, I mean, I was trying to ask a question, but really the question is, you know, part of the leveraging that we're doing as an industry is that we're using these IP switching platforms in a kind of standard way. We're using them the way that the banks use them and that the data centers use them for the most part. Um, so is there any other industry or is there even evidence of any other industry 
that's trying to do time aware or position and stream aware switching inside the switch. I, I'm not aware of such a such an application in any other industry. And when we try to do things that are television specific inside these, what we like to think of as common off the shelf platforms, that's where I think we get into trouble as an industry with our expectation. Okay. All right, very good. Well, Carl, thank you. Uh, and thanks to the others that uh, jumped in there. We appreciate that, off to a great start. If anybody has any other thoughts on this, Carl, um, maybe they can shoot you a note in the chat or, or get in touch with you um, about this. And thanks for a great presentation. Thank you.